Welcome, friends, to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. Back in the 1980s, those headiest of days when I gradually transitioned from eagerly spending my pocket money on Spangles, Wambars, and £1.99 Firebird, Coastmasters, and Mastertronic games for my trusty ZX Spectrum, over to scouring second-hand bookshops to expand upon the treasures I was still receiving on a regular basis from Pops and my uncles, and the golden oldie record shop for vinyl, usually of the heavy metal variety, but also to feed my Alan Price addiction, I first set foot in a new record shop in Hull called Offbeat. It opened up a new world of music experiences and artists that weren't typically front and centre in Golden Oldie, or, for new and sealed albums and singles, Hull's premier music store Sydney Scarborough's, fondly referred to back in the days as Sid Scabs. It was probably around about the same time, give or take a year, that Games Workshop released the original Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader rulebook, with that vivid cover by John Civic depicting futuristic armoured soldiers under fire atop a mound of their fallen comrades, one holding aloft an orc's head as he fires at enemies out of frame. An incredibly striking, and, as we've come to know from the outrageous success of that line over the last 35 plus years, as influential and iconic an image as exists in British science fiction of pretty much any type. Like many other people, I'd come across the image first of all on a cover of an issue of White Dwarf magazine, but I never was a wargamer, so the Warhammer 40,000 line never held much interest for me beyond the obvious Mokokian tropes shot through much of the law, and we've talked about that in passing on a few occasions on this podcast. My real connection with it came on a visit to Offbeat Records on High Street in Hull's Old Town. Tucked away down an alley in an old dockside warehouse on the banks of the River Hull, Offbeat felt different, satisfyingly niche, obscure, yet fresh. And the folks that found and frequented it were the oddballs, counterculture weirdos, nerds, goths and dropouts that I identified and hung out with on leaving school. It was in Offbeat that that John Sibic image leapt off the shelf at me on an album cover, still to this day the best possible portable medium for incredible, accessible art, and that album was Bolt Thrower's Realm of Chaos, just about as more cocky in an album title as you can find. I knew nothing about the band, but killer album art, including a gatefold sleeve within a liner art by none other than Ian Miller, and a massive chaos symbol on the back straight out of the pages of all the Moorcock I'd been consuming over the past few years, it was a no-brainer. Even better, getting it to my mate's house that night and playing it was a game-changer. Pounding propulsive metal with strains of punk and hardcore, underpinned by a brutal rhythm section and tied together by the monstrous throat roars of one Carl Willits. So I never did get into Warhammer 40,000, although 30 odd years later I did enjoy reading some of the RPG spin-offs, starting with Dark Heresy, and I've played the pure fantasy version of that property with Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay on and off since the 80s. But discovering Realm of Chaos sent me on a journey with Bolt Thrower over nine albums, not including EPs and compilations, up until the sudden tragic passing of drummer Martin Cairns, and subsequently Carl's later band, the British hard metal supergroup Memorium that continues to this day, and finding they were a stridently anti-fascist and anti-Nazi was the icing on the cake. Fast forward to 2023, here I am listening to Memorium's fifth release, Rise to Power, and it strikes me, I have to get Carl on the podcast. I gave the astropath on the Don Blass a kick, beamed a message through the Immaterium, I'm delighted to say he agreed. So, power up your Voxcaster, recite a litany of protection, light a low stick, and join Carl and me as we discuss Memorium, Bolt Thrower, Warhammer, and Carl's Three Rules of Beer. Back in Derry and Tom's, and with me, I'm absolutely delighted to have Carl Willits is with me in Derry and Tom's. Good. So, legendary death metal vocalist, frontman of Memorium, who've just released their fifth album, Rise to Power, and beer lover, Carl Willits. Welcome, Carl, and thanks for coming on. It is a pleasure, and it is a grim, cold, wet, oh, windy, yeah. in the grips of hurricane or storm kieran whatever it's called yeah uh, where, where about yeah. are cal i am in the west midlands just south of birmingham uh the metal metropolis 
the home of metal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I live in, I live in the posh bits, so they are. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's it's good. It's great, but, you know, it's November. It's supposed to be like this, isn't it? So, you know. Yeah, it is really. It's done nothing but rain here for about five days now. I don't think well, the sun's it, even it, peaked through one little bit. So, yeah, you've just got to get used to it, haven't you? It always rains in Bradford. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, li- living in the north, you just get used to it. It's but I've, I've had the, uh, what do they call it, the... Um, the SAD lamp on this week. <laughs> well, I've been working from home, keeping Please my fingers me, crossed that it actually the, works. Pretending yeah. it's still sunny. I like it. I like it. That hope, that glimmer of hope. Of so we all need to go on holiday. That's what it is. But yeah, so here we are on a Thursday night, and uh, this is all very nice. It's about time we, uh, we we hooked up and and did this. I think we've been talking about it for a while, haven't we? So um, well, here we yeah. are. I mean, the, the funny thing is, it's um, I think we first came across each other on Twitter probably around about 2015. Yeah. And for one reason or another, we ended up following each other. And thinking back, I remember thinking, because at, at the time, um, my Twitter feed wasn't really about uh, music and role-playing games and podcasting and things like that. I, mean, I didn't start the podcast back in 2015. Oh, yeah. It was more <laughs> about um, politics, the Labour Party, socialism, and various That's other probably and pieces. what drew me to you as a, as a as a connection in the very yeah. first. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, it has evolved into something bigger and more. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, funnily enough, 2015 seems like a really fucking long time ago uh, now it, it in is. politics. It it's, is, yeah, yeah. In, in, in every in every sense of the word, it seems like a, a lifetime ago, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, such a lot has happened since 2000. Well, it's only bloody eight years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's flown past, but yeah. such a lot has happened within that space of time. It's, it's an incredible uh, decade. Uh, mm. and, yeah, those are things that you wouldn't anticipate uh, to have happened. Have happened no, and, no uh, certainly not. Lots of challenges to us all. Yeah, I mean, I think back at the time, most of the time, I was just um, enth- enthusing about uh, the new direction for the Labour Party. Uh, yeah, that didn't go very well, did it? Um, yeah, it didn't. It was, there was a glimmer of hope, though. There was, at that point in time, it did all look very you know, good and sunny, and, and like, like things were going to change, but it, 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 politics and the thing, the thing that does change is it. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I do remember at the time thinking, um, think Carl Willits, and over the course of a couple of days, I thought, is it is it is it Carl Willits? Carl Willits. Yeah. I looked, well, oh fucking hell, it is. It is incredible. There's only one. Because... Carl, there's, there's actually two Carl Willitses. There's there's another one that I'm in contact contact with. He's a pretty well known actor based down in New Zealand. Who's in ah. the Evil Dead? Uh, nice bloke. Yeah. No way. <laughs> <laughs> nice bloke. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so of course you know thinking back in the mists of time to when my beard wasn't white. Maybe mm. I didn't even have a beard. I probably did. Yeah, well, but you, of know, course, you know, my hair was nice and blonde. It's now pretty yeah. much white as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I f- first came across you, of course, via um, Bolt Thrower. So I'm probably round about 1988 or 89 or something like that. I'm in a record shopping hole called Offbeat Records and an album, actually two albums, leapt off the shelf at me. One of them was um, uh, the first Bolt, sorry, actually the second Bolt Thrower album, Realm of Chaos. Realm of Chaos, yeah, yeah. But the one with the the very, very recognisable John Sibick artwork yes. from the cover of Warhammer 40,000. So, the one no, that we were licensed to use, yes, indeed, yes. Yeah, so I was, I was never a, a Warhammer player, but I was a role-playing game player, and you know, et cetera, et cetera, and into my genre fiction. Yeah, that so business. that's how kind of the whole that imagery of it worked, worked my life. Was, I yeah, was it just fucking leapt off the rack at me. <laughs> and of course, so for the next subsequent, you know, seven, eight mm. albums, I was listening to Bolt Thrower. And then as things tend to go as you get older, some things kind of slip into the background. So coming across you on Twitter, and then a couple of years later, a car you announced the first Memoriam album, yes. and all of a sudden you're back in business. So, I am back better than before. Well, uh, and, and not yeah, only back absolutely. in business, but five albums in yeah. I know, yeah, in it's, six it's, years. It is incredible pace that we are working at, but you know it's intentional. That's what we mm. wanted to do. You know, we we we'd never we never sit down and, and thought, right, well, when we when we kind of 2015, when we thought, right, let's do this, we all sat down and said, well. How do we want to do it? What do we want to? What do we want to be? What do we want to achieve? You know, and we thought, well, you know, we're doing this for some, you know, for the joy of doing it. You know, I'm definitely not doing it for the money. Uh, <laughs> pick the wrong, pick the wrong career if you have. Um, so, so yeah, we're just doing it for the joy of it. And we want to just really kind of create 
Yeah, because it's all been through quite a lot of, you know, upheaval and turmoil and, you know, Kitty passing away. So it's, it was quite a dark, you know, phase period of my life. And, and uh, you know, so we, we all sat down. For, well, let's, let's just try and create some of the, the joy that uh, we had when we first started out doing mm. music. Yeah, because that kind of, after doing it for like you know, 20, 30 years, you just get a bit jaded. You kind of like get, get a bit stuck in a rut and sometimes it lose the... You know, the enthusiasm of what you're doing and, and all you lose that spark of why you did it in the first place. Mm. So we wanted to try and recreate that feeling of, of, of that fast pace of, of not really just sitting around and spending four years writing and recording, but you know, kind of like trying to kind of live in the moment and kind of like press forward and, and, and just each album being a snapshot of that specific point in time and rolling forward rather than dwelling on it just rolling forward and doing the next one we're quite mm. lucky in the fact that we've got quite a prolific songwriter amongst our mix which is Mr Scott Fairfax so I think he's you know, I'll get all credit to him he's predominantly the driving force of why we are uh, producing albums in such a um, radical fast rate that we are mm. doing and yeah, we've we've te- we've kept that timetable. Table, you know, first three albums did come out with it. We you know in quite a quick succession, one every year. Hmm. And then obviously we did, talked about this previously. The whole impact of COVID did make it a little bit more difficult to engage with one or two to record and, and write and, and get it sorted for the, the, the next couple of albums. But Eighteen months it took to those ones, and, and in a way, it just gave us a little bit more space. Mm. Yeah, you know, I think, and it, to be, it really did benefit the last two albums in particular. I mean, rather than just sticking to that one year, that's it. It's got to be that. We now have got like an eighteen month schedule between the uh, the albums, and that extra six months gives us a little bit of extra leeway to you know perfect the songs a little bit more, work mm. on them, you know, structure them a bit more, uh, and you know, so we, we kind of. The last couple of albums, I think, probably our strongest and have kind of like come out a bit more diverse as well than, than the previous ones we did. So, you know, we got to that point, I think, after four or five albums, we finally kind of found out who we are. Mm. Uh, we got our identity. Maybe, you know, the shackles of, of the past are, you know, a good thing. And that's, you know, we are who we are. And we are more from what we have come from before, you know, mm. in the bands we've done previously. They've obviously helped us to achieve what we achieved, but you know, in a, in a, it's like a double-edged sword, sword in many ways. You know, you know, kind of like a lot of people, you know, struggled to accept us for what we were because they were either not enough like Bolt Thrower or too much like Bolt Thrower. And that whole dichotomy was, uh, you know, like an ever decreasing, you know, any ever decreasing circles and wasn't really helpful, really. I think we've got beyond that now. I'd like to think we've got beyond that. I don't think we'll ever break the losing completely because hmm. we are who we are, but, but uh, I think we've managed to break away from that, those, you know, arguments and pigeonholes, and, and we are now accepted as memoriam. Hallelujah. Mm. Mm. Well, <laughs> and in a way, you're kind of a super group as well, yeah. aren't you? Because um, you, you've got heritage, well, heritage that includes not just bolt throw, but uh, benediction. You like super. I've had quite a, I've had quite, I've quite a lot of super as well recently, so, yeah, you are a super. <laughs> yeah. It's a group. But um, benediction, yeah. napalm death, killing joke. There's, there's all sorts of heritage Absolutely. in there. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, kind of at, at our point in our lives, uh, we have got heritage, we have got a history behind us all, and we're doing that. That really kind of counts. We kind of know what we're doing as well. You know, we yeah. we we, we're, uh, we we do it on. I say, you know, going back to what I said originally, we do it fun. We do it because we enjoy doing it. No yeah. other reason really. And yeah, you know, we intend to keep on doing that until we don't enjoy it anymore, mm-hmm. and then we'll stop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but at this point in time. I would love, yeah, kind of like to think. Oh, I, I would say that I'm kind of probably enjoying it now more than I ever done ever done in the past because I kind of appreciate it for what it is, and mm. we kind of get to do things the way we want to do it. You know, we've got more direction and control over what we do. We, we pick and choose what we want to do more so than having to do it because we've got to do it. You know, so um, yeah, and we're happy with that. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. So thinking about that, you know, the, the, the heritage angle, normally when we have a new guest on this podcast, one of the first questions that we tend to ask is, because generally we're a Michael Mocock flavoured podcast, although we do branch out a little bit from time to time, we That's generally it. tend to ask the guest, um, you know, what's your uh, background with Mocock or with genre fiction? Now, of course, for you as a musician who's 
um, first band Bolt Throw was, I think a lot of people probably experienced Bolt Throw like I did through the recognition of those, like sort of icon- the iconic imagery. And Absolutely. not just the iconic imagery, but the lyricism as well. Now, funnily enough, I I was never kind of put myself down as a death metal fan. I think one thing that that did was draw in a whole host of new people to inverted it was commas. A death very metal. clever piece of cross marketing. Yeah, worked well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, didn't really understand that at the time, but looking back at it, that's what it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. You know, I come from a gaming background myself you know when, yeah. I was, when I was younger I read a lot of Michael Moorcock you uh-huh. know and I got a lot of fancy you know kind of um, or Conan, Conan books things like that you yeah. know as well so I was really inspired with that and that kind of kind of got my my head kind of set and that kind of like evolved uh, into the early years of playing Dungeons and Dragons you know at the yeah. age of you know 13 12 13 around that age of getting into all that kind of the fantasy side of things, which was, you know, a very good bit of escapism in a, a world. I mean, where were they? Really kind of like the early 80s, I suppose, very early mm. 80s. Mm. You know, so there's a lot going on in the world. So it's got, yeah, yeah, they were young. And that kind of once defined me at a very young age and gave me you know, some escapism. And uh, it was great. It was great to expand your mind into that kind of those kind of areas as well, you know. And that kind of led into my... Um, my interest in tabletop wargaming, which mm. which kind of spanned from that, you know, there's all, all sorts of genres of that. You know, of course, you know, um, so it came came from the Dungeons and Dragons to more of a you know kind of landscape based tabletop wargaming, all sorts. You know, um, yeah. I, my, I think one of my specific favourites was one three hundred scale World War Two. That was one of my uh, just that really small scale. I think yeah. it's a big level that was great. I used to do that quite a lot. You know, obviously. He got into the, the games workshop stuff, the early yeah. early games workshop stuff, you know, Warhammer. Yeah. And uh, then he went on to 40K as well. Yeah. But there's all sorts of other games that are out there as well. I mean, one of my favourite games is a, a, a Western kind of tabletop. You know, it was a kind of a, a role-playing game, but you could be, yeah. because we, we sat a big Western town and we had characters and, and figures and did it that way. It's called Booth Hill. Have you ever came yeah. across that game? Yeah. Oh, Love yeah. That yeah. Game. Yeah. Love that game. Absolutely. I spent hours playing Boot Hill. Um, you know, Car Wars, all sorts yeah. of, yeah, there's lots of different kind of games that kind of free computer game time. Yeah. You know, where, you know, you kind of let your mind kind of like create the worlds rather than being it created for you and, and it goes with, you know, nothing not taken away from, from computer games. They're great, you know, but um, not, not be, kind of like be after my time, really, of that. So, so yeah, that really spanned onto, you know, my, Real in, in depth kind of games workshop phase, I'd call it, mm. uh, where I'd spend you know weeks, even nights playing huge, massive, epic uh, battles, uh, painting. Mm. You know, I used to kind of spend my life um, painting, painting, you know, small figures and things like that. That was that was what I did, painting, and that was kind of really when I started to kind of break away from that in a way or merge. That with my love of music as well, yeah. kind of that's because I was around about how old I was, must have been about sixteen around that time, and that's when I started to, start to discover all these different type of of music out, out there, and you know, I got these, started to get into the kind of tape trading thing, oh. uh, you know, so I was getting these tapes sent to me from all over the world, from you know South America and Scandinavia and North America, where you get these. Someone sends you a tape of this band called Metal Liquor, uh, you know, metal up your ass demo and things <laughs> yeah. like that. You know, think, what's all this about? You know, it's a bit different. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah, but at that stage, I was just really, really into being punk. Yeah, I mean, the kind of you, hardcore anarcho punk, that's my thing. Crass, anti sex, yeah. yeah. flux of pink Indians, all that kind of thing was the thing that really drove me into the you know, political stance that, that I yeah. came from. Uh, so when I started hearing all these more kind of, you know, metal y kind of, sounding things uh it was a bit of a, an epiphany really i just you know what well, this is a little bit exciting it kind of always went hand in hand with the with the miniatures and the tabletop wargaming and mm. it just kind of all evolved out of that and we kind of like started to use so you know i, I was into the music and but yeah no no intention of ever, ever really being in a band at that mm. at that point of my life you know that came a few years 
later on down the line, you know, and that was just more by luck than any form of skill or judgment. Hmm. Um, I kind of fell into being in, in ball thrower, really, because um, my best mate that I used to do all the tabletop war gaming, Tom, Tom Walker, if you listen to this, Tom, hello. He's now the uh, Deputy imp- imp- Interior of Minister of Jersey. <laughs> I don't think we should talk about Jersey tonight, should we be? Really? I think they're, uh, yeah, so anyhow, yeah. uh, <laughs> Tom, we like Tom, he's, he's step sister was married to a chap of punk, they're both punks, married to a chap called Andrew Whale. And yeah, we kind of got to meet Whale and Andrew Whale. We went to, he was in a band called Urban Chaos, went to see a few of their gigs and thought, that's pretty good. And then he, he started drumming for a band called Bolt Thrower. So I went around, went to see, see them a few times. I thought, oh, she's, she's pretty good with the Mermaid and places like in Birmingham, legendary uh, places. I thought, this is, she's, she's pretty good. And uh, um, yeah, at that point in my life, I'd I, I learned to drive. I could I pass my test. And they started to play gigs a little bit further afield, like London. And yeah, they got a John Peel session, so they needed someone to drive them. I could drive. I got the job as their driver. I wouldn't call roadie because you know what I was doing, but I drove them places, and that was great. And you know, I did that for about a year or so, eighteen months. It was fun. And then the they got a record. They obviously they sent off the demo to uh, to John Peel. Wait, when was this? This would be about eighty six, eighty seven. Hmm. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's all a bit of a blur. Uh, <laughs> and um, he liked it. Obviously, played played uh, the demo. Offered them uh, a John Peel session, which I drove them down to. And off the back of that. The band got a record deal with Final Solution to record mm. the first album in Battle There Is No Law. And at that point, the original singer, Alan, lovely lad, um, he decided that he was all getting a bit too serious, a bit too much commitment for him mm. to, to do. So he decided to, to move on and left the band, which left them a vocalist, vocalist less. Vocalist less? Yeah, vocalist less. Uh, and so really just by default, well, I got the job because they knew me. <laughs> they knew me. I kind of knew the songs and I could drive. So, so yeah, I kind of I fit the bill in that. So it wasn't through any vocal ability or skill or or anything like that. It was just the fact that I was just there. So I've, I've, got, I've got to ask. I've got to ask. So how, how do you go from thinking, right, okay, I know the songs, to turning out a performance on Realms of Chaos, which is probably one of the... Now, you know, labels are always an odd thing, aren't they? Because actually, when we talk about things like death metal, I always think Bolt Throw had a lot more groove than yeah. a lot of, than, than most kind of classical... Classical. Most classic yeah. death, death metal bands. I think that was, that was the chief sprinkly ingredient into the, what, we, what we brought to the scene was that kind of groove. To, yeah, to I, I, I don't really listen to any other death metal, but I was, you know, I listen no, to Bolt Throw. Um, <laughs> co- copious amounts yeah. of Bolt Throw because, because of that groove. But yeah. how do you go from, okay, you know the songs, to turning out a performance that actually established you in the space of one album as yeah. like the one of the premier death metal Shriekers are well. You're not a shrieker um, because that's the wrong. Yes, I, uh, I would call it rhythmical shouting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how I define what I do. I am a yeah. rhythmical shouter. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, you see, obviously, yeah, you, 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 you do your apprenticeship, don't you? You kind of be played. You know, when I joined the band, obviously, I, it's probably about a month before we recorded the album, so it's a bit of a uh, what am I doing? What a uh, well then. And you just just can't it really. Uh, you just, just just go like yeah, I've got I've got, I've got got away with it all my life really. Just just if, if you're not if you're not really kind of like a, as long as you're confident in what you do and pretend yeah. you know what you're doing, you usually get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I found. Uh, confidence gets you a long way, and that's something that I've never really uh, lacked. I'm, you know, I think I'm quite a confident individual. Um, and that really helps, you know, the fact that I kind of I can engage with people. I quite, quite mm. like talking to people. And, you know, kind of, uh, so that really, really helps, that, having that kind of like uh, outgoing kind of personality really, really did. I wasn't really what you call an introvert. Uh, but, yeah, of course, you know, the first year of, of doing it between, you know, the battle and the release of um, the realm of chaos, we did shit those gigs around the UK. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that was a real eye-opener. And that's how I really kind of, like, learned 
to build my confidence of what, in what I was doing. And it, it, it comes from self belief, really, you know, uh, and enjoying what you're doing, you know, and really kind of not, not overthinking what you're doing, but just hmm. really enjoying what. And you, the, I've always said it, you know, the vocals just come from the music. Hmm. If you ask me now to go, yeah, you know, I do get it asked all the time. Go on, Carl, do you do you do your death metal voice? <laughs> do your vault thrower voice, Carl. Uh I said, no, I can't I can't I can't do it without the music. You know, well, I'm not a performing monkey. Uh I have to yeah, I have to be in that environment, have that yeah. kind of feel, that, that wall of sound be able to be able to deliver that kind of that, that vocal delivery. Yeah. And uh, that's it kind of goes hand in hand. But um it was great because you know, we, we kind of we kind of we liked that kind of games workshop. I was still again. Yeah, Game, you know, doing you know, gaming and things like that a lot, yeah. and it kind of like they heard what we were doing. They heard the uh, games workshop, heard what they were doing, and they kind of like invited us along to have a meeting with them. And and this was just before we signed with Earache. In fact, we were contemplating signing to them directly as a record label because they, yeah. they were setting up. They had so Sabat. I think they released with Sabat, and there some other little irons in the fire when they were. You know, thinking about setting up their own games workshop record, record label, and, and mm. yeah, we were going to potentially sign to them directly. But you know, like came on the scene. We thought, well, you know, they know they, they know they kind of know the market better. They've got some good bands on them, and yeah, they've got the distribution network. You know, the ability to to, mm. to get our records on a global scale. So, so we kind of thought, well, it'd be nice to still maintain that contact with Games Workshop and use their imagery uh, and kind of have some collaboration between the two, which we did with, with Round Mask Chaos, which made it what it was. You know, it made it that standout album mm. visually. Yeah, for me, it's great because I was like, you know, can you because I've got free, you know, going go to the games where I like, oh, I love that, 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 I love that. I could come out with boxes of stuff, free. Yeah. It's brilliant. <laughs> it was great period of, of my life, you know, and uh, it was great to have that kind of all that visually. That's that's that kind of artwork that you love and and kind of is part of your world and your life that you've been engaged with for the past five or six years. And to be have that as to represent you in your you know, musical career was was brilliant, you know. And um, yeah, it really really worked well for for Alma Chaos. Um, and then we followed up with the next album, War Master, didn't we? Um, mm -hmm. Where we still retained the artwork of Mr. Pete Nifton. He did the artwork for that for us, uh, but independently because he, you know, we didn't we didn't do it directly through Games yeah. Workshop because we we were with Earache as the as the label. And um, yeah, I mean, we just all stand on from there, and uh, then we started to you know play gigs abroad. Um, you know, getting more of a, a following, and that was that was an eye opener for us because, th but to that point, we, you know, just bumbled around the UK, thinking, "Well, this is good." And then soon we got over to the mainland, Europe, which we've got no longer a path. Um, or, um, it was an eye opener, it's a game changer, you know, because we realised that there's a whole massive, massive, huge market over there, and it kind of like took us up to the next, to the next level, yeah, which was, mm -hmm. which, yeah, it was a, a massive. Massive advancement in our career, really. I mean, it was a great time doing it for, I did it, you know, I carried on doing it till about 94, 95. Hmm. Played Australia, played, played America, played Europe several times, you know, carried on playing the UK. It was, it was, it was great, a great period of my life when it was just all happening, really. We did, there was no real, oh, we're going to do this. It just all happened, you know, and, yeah. uh, and you know, it, it, it was like, part of something really fresh, something really new. Mm -hmm. um, we really didn't at that point know that it was going to be such a, you know, a big, big thing. We just didn't, we were having a great time doing it. And looking back at in retrospect, it was a huge influence on a, on a whole generation of people. So, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been great to be part of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll come back to kind of the, the influences um, afterwards, but... You had a massive, massive impact on that, like post Nawabum, um, new wave of British heavy metal, British rock scene. Mm. What, what was it like to be part of that metal scene? Because of course, the late eighties, Nawabum is is kind of dying down a little bit. But there's bands like you, 
Sabbath are my other favourite band from that period. Mm. Obviously, the, yeah. the, they were as prodigious in their output as as Bolt Thrower were, um, but they they were coming along. Also, the John Blanche connection, of course, because John Blanche did the design for your album. I think he did the visual design for the album cover and the font and everything. And he yes. did. Um, I think it was was it Dreamweaver or History of a Time to Come has got a, a, a John Blanche cover as well. So that yeah. connection there. But yeah. th- this kind of period in in really fucking hardcore British metal, which was transcending some of the more like, you know, sort of cock rocky tendencies. Yeah. The metal yeah. Scene. I think it was a, you know, in a way, a direct reaction to, you know, that. Yeah, you know, I was I was never really into me new wave of I was aware of it, new wave of yeah. British early metal. It wasn't my thing, yeah. You know, my thing was the uh, the Anaco Punk thing, you know, and, yeah. and then then hearing the, the likes of Slayer and Tiger and these you know, Swedish bands, you know, with this kind of chainsaw guitars, uh, but playing in a really technical, stylish way, you know, kind of like so that the metal edge combined with that punk ethos were really what that was our driving sense of influence. Um, you know, I always remember, I think it was on my 21st birthday, it was just before, I, I don't know, around that time when I joined the band, and I just, you know, saw Sacrilege, you were my favourite UK band, favourite band. Still are. Uh, and watching them perform, you know, Damien, fantastic guitarist, still is. Uh, Tam, my favourite all time vocalist, uh, totally inspirational. And that was a kind of light bulb moment watching them thinking, ah, I could do that. I'd like to do that. That'd be brilliant. And um, so that, that was really important to us. But yeah, I mean, maybe maybe in a way it was, it just different. It was just, it was a natural thing that just came from us. I don't think it was, you know, a kind of like um, an intentional kind of reaction to to what was going on before. They really didn't really pay any attention to your, you know, your Judas Priest or your, mm. you know, kind of like Iron Maidens and things like that. You know, they're both great fans of what they do in their own in their own right. It's never really been my cup of tea or my my thing. Yeah, I, yeah, never would ever deny the greatness of Black Sabbath though. The Black Sabbath, uh, coming from Birmingham, you've got to say that. Well, yeah, you get, uh, you get run out of the Midlands, don't yeah, you? Yeah, you, you, you get kicked out of town if you, if you said anything yeah. bad about Black Sabbath in Birmingham. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so so yeah, it was just a, a natural kind of evolution. It was, it was like a whole new wave of something different, you know. The, and every band that was involved in it, well, Carcass, hmm. you know, uh, Na- Napalm, you know, from the UK, was like, everyone had a different kind of edge and take on it it was very hard to pigeon us all in one kind of big you know where we grind core where we yeah. death metal where we thrash metal we got I remember we, got, we <laughs> referred to as uh, a drunk slayer in one of the <laughs> early reviews like, yeah, in Quran which I thought was quite good um, <laughs> um, so yeah it was very hard to kind of pigeon all and just you know decide what, what that genre was it was just a whole wave of, of kids uh, creating something, um, you know, just different and, and noisy and aggressive uh, yeah. with a bit of style to it, you know. And it was it was great to be involved with it, you know. It was a whole new wave of something different. So yeah, yeah, it was, it's made had a huge huge impact. Yeah, yeah. Funnily enough, that day I was in Offbeat Records and I found Realm of Chaos. I was with my mate Riggy. And Riggy bought State of Putrefaction <laughs> by Napalm Death. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah. I think that album was called State of Putrefaction. No, Reek of, Reek of, Reek of, Reek of Putrefaction. Reek of by Putrefaction. Carcass. By far we- their best album ever, in my humble opinion. Yeah, well, Genital, I'll, I'll, Genital Grinder still remains my, my, my favourite song of theirs. Yeah, our, our listening party that evening was <laughs> was, was, was pretty aggressive. <laughs> uh, but I bet I bet your parents loved you. Well, funnily enough, it was, I was at Riggy's house because uh, back back in those days, my family had moved out to a village, so I spent most of my time staying at my mates' houses right, yeah, or, yeah. or at my uh, or at my nana and pop's house in all. Um, so, in in yeah. civilization. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't stand village life, so I spent as much time as possible as I could in the city. But yeah, Offbeat Records was a was a great source. I think that's also the place where I found where I first came across the Thousand Homo DJs version of Supernaut, just just yeah. on the shelf. I saw, I saw the sleeve. I was like, oh, what's this? Because of course, you know, super familiar with Black Sabbath. It was an absolute treasure of that shop. It was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's, there's few and far between these days, aren't they? You know, mm. sure everything ends online. There are a few, right? Yeah, I mean, London's few great record shops, yeah. and things like that, you know. But uh, 
yeah, fair play from for uh, and wise of birth. Yeah. Yeah. Fair, 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 fair play from maintaining and waving that flag and still doing it. But uh, yes, these were the places where you kind of like find, found all these, you know, these this rare, you know, kind of music. And you know, yeah, you know, it's really, really remember. It's all about vinyl. But then, you know, before CDs and things like that, you know, and always remember buying these rare, obscure records just because you liked what the cover looked like really more than anything else because you hadn't heard it. Mm-hmm. And then kind of looking at it in awe on the bus on mm-hmm. the way home, you know, the big the packaging. It's always been about the, the, the tactile, the imagery. It's always been like that for me. You know, yeah. uh, that's been one of the main important things about putting out a record. It's the music's fine, important, very important. The vocals are important. For me in particular, but just as important is the the imagery and the actual product itself, you know. And you know, in, in a way, CDs, little things, just, you know, I don't know. Got, got, it's just got that, the same. That, that yeah. You know, reading, reading, yeah, you know, all the song titles and the, and the inner sleeve and all the pictures. Yeah. And that was all part of the uh, the glory of vinyl, you know, which has thankfully can't come back as well over the past uh, few years, you know. And uh, the whole record collecting thing is is, is massive, you know. It's kind of Really, in a way, it's helped research the uh, popularity of the scene in, in, in many respects. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was it was it was great. I say imagery important. You know, it always has been important for what for me, whatever band I've been in. Uh, mm. it, it's key to that. You know, and, and it's it all come from the whole you know, the whole tape trading thing. That's that all part of the important part of. Of uh, kind of hearing these rare things from across the world, and it made you feel a little bit more, you know, connected. Having these little letters, it was all you know, obviously not no internet then, so it was all packages in the post from exotic places in the world with handwritten letters which you could hardly read from from you know different people from across the world. And that was a really exciting time to be uh, be alive. It was really it was good. So some of this has been a little bit uh, regenerated, I think, in recent years because um, you know, with things like Bandcamp and helping to, uh, I know Bandcamp's going through a bit of a fucking schism at the moment with the with the takeover, but that that ability to like, re-democratize music and allow people to get vinyl out and to get i mean behind me i've got bloody cassettes for god's sake yeah i, yeah. Bu- I mean I, cassettes, I they've, they've, they've made a comeback as well haven't they? i had to go out and buy a cassette player because i, I was on band camp and there was some dungeons in that it's saying oh you know for a tenner have it on cassette i was like oh fuck yeah and then you know Excellent. all of a sudden i've got cassettes oh. and i haven't got a cassette player so i went need <laughs> yeah. to get a cassette player <laughs> yeah but i think get, I get think your own really on its own house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it really has made music more exciting again. Yeah, it has. And, it has. You know. It's got opened up on a whole wider scale and it's more accessible for for everyone to to contribute towards and, and get yeah. out as well. You know, it's it's it, 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 there's such, such a lot going on. You know, with, with the impact of the internet as well, it has made everything a lot more um, accessible. It's made it probably a bit more difficult for bands, I think, in many respects, because there's so many other people. Doing it, doing it, and it's there yeah. at, at your fingertips. So, so it's very hard sometimes to to wade through the morose, morose of stuff that's out there and and find stuff that really floats your boat. But when you do, it, it makes it that bit more special, really. I think you know, that's, mm. that's, that's the key in it. So, you find something that, 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 that you feel that belongs to you is yours. Your find, you know, there's only a small group of people that know about it. That's that's uh, that's kind of like you know, that's kind of what it's about it really absolutely there was always that excitement back in the day of like you say getting sent a cassette and thinking wow this is so fucking different so um out there so not tv not commercial radio and so niche there's always a little yeah. bit of excitement about discovering something like that, and it gets think, harder though, doesn't it? Yeah, because so many people does. doing stuff these days, just get harder these days to find something that really. Yeah, but yeah. we find that. Yeah, we we we're more. You know, people really, really, really like what we do. You know, kind of like you know, I think we've got we're lucky that we we got to the point in our career where we've we drawn from the fan base of what we've done previously to a certain extent. Hmm. Uh, and people, you know, some people can't stand what we do, which is fine. Don't I don't want expect everyone to like it. Uh, but the people that do like it really like it, you know, and that's 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 really what keeps us going, keeps us motivated, motivated and drives us forward at the rapid pace that we are at. And of course, you're knocking out albums with terrific cover artwork as well. Which well, this is it. We've made, uh, always uh, a winner. Links into what we were saying previously. The, the artwork has always really been important, for, and for me, 
you know, one of the things we sat down when we, as I said, we had our master plan meeting at the very start, we all went sat around the table and came up with different things about what we wanted to achieve. And, you know, one of those things was releasing an album every year at a fast pace. And uh, Scott's little ten penny worth into, into the pot was he'd really like to have, do an album and have Dan Seagrave do a cover for us. So, you know, we obviously, obviously approached him on the first one hmm. and he came up with that spectacular you know um cover which is you know phenomenal uh and you know five albums later he's still with us <laughs> yeah he's coming on a journey with us and and to have him involved there he is in the background that's double um mm-hmm. to have him involved in the process is is incredible to to be to have just one of your, your random ideas that you, you kind of put in, in, in your head what you'd like to see on a cover, so you just fire over a, a word document with what we'd like to have, what the album's called, um, what we'd like to have on it, uh, what kind of you know, kind of colour range we'd like to see, and then he kind of goes away with it, comes back with a load of sketches, and says, "Well, what do you fancy about this one?" This one gives us seven or eight different alternatives, and we're kind of part of that creative process in, in putting it together at the early stages. Mm-hmm. And once we kind of define what we want to do, he just goes off. And comes up with you know something like that, which is you know it's amazing to be part of that process from you know these ideas in here that to to something that like that comes out like that. It, it, it's fantastic. We're really pleased and proud to have Dan as our artist. Hopefully, fingers crossed, he'll be doing album number six for us as well. Mm. It's just fantastic. Al- albums as cultural artifacts and pieces of art in and of themselves mm. is mm. just so exciting. And, Absolutely. But, they tell a story as well. Yeah, like, ours yeah. kind of like flow to what to kind of like kind of we've got been released. In, you know, this, this is going to be the last album, our second trilogy. Yeah. Uh, so they kind of like flow and and kind of like can, can kind, of, kind of maintain that sense of continuity between all the the albums that we do. Continuity, continuity. Yeah. Uh, that's the word. Uh, and so yeah, it kind of like it makes helps it make sense and draws it all together as well as a, as a whole like story. So. For people, perhaps, who are listening to this who remember Bolt Thrower or Bolt Thrower fans, but don't follow you on Twitter, have kind of gone into deep freeze with a lot of these things like we all do when we hit a certain age. Thematically, what is behind the Memoriam albums, the two trilogies? Yeah, well, it's a journey, really. Uh, You know, the overarching theme is death, (laughs) sorrow, war, all all the standard generic death metal content. Uh, obviously, you know, the lyrical content is just varying. You know, I do take the opportunity to uh, to write some social commentary and some political uh, soapbox stuff, which is I enjoy doing. I haven't done that before. But the actual general theme and the visual imagery is just following the, the, the life of this one central character mm. from his death to his birth, really. So it's, it's kind of in reverse... It's like a, a kind of like a, a story in reverse. It's like a it's like a, a Star Wars sequel prequel type type affair. So mm-hmm. we're just following this this life of this this you know, it starts off with him being yeah, it's it's got it speaks to it's got a weird one. So the first trilogy starts with him being paraded across he's dead because he's just been killed in battle. So he's being paraded across the uh, the kind of like savage battlefield. And then the next one is where he's the body is laying in state, and then the, the one after that is where the body is he's buried, put to the ground. So for the second trilogy, the, well, where do we where do we go from there? So we've kind of explored the bit before he dies. So we're going from there backwards. So, so the, the, the album number five to the end, four to the end. <laughs> <it's not> easy <laughs> Um, is is where he kind of like the bit before he dies in the battle. So he's there, revving up his troops, about to go into the battle, which he dies, which is the, the first trilogy. And then we're working backwards. So this this one is rise to power. So this is the bit before the battle. So he's there in all his glory, in his strength, and he's at the height of his power. So, so um, I'm not quite sure where the next one's going to go. <laughs> We've got some ideas. We've got some ideas, but it's going to obviously potentially be an earlier part of this trilogy, which will be the last part of it, so which means potentially we've got to do another one. Well, I hope so. Well, yeah, you can't, you can't have two trilogies, can you, really? If you can have a trilogy, 
if you're working threes, if you have working threes, it's got to be three threes on it. So you've got to have yeah. a triptych of threes. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's it, doesn't, it doesn't right work. Right. It doesn't work otherwise. It's two, two <laughs> dots of three. Yeah. That's not right. So I've, 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 I haven't told the band this. I've got to, I've got to still convince them that, that they've got to do another three albums. <laughs> uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be all right. Scott's got the stuff already. Scott, Scott's probably got three albums worth of stuff in his million dollar, million dollar riff vault sitting there already. I well, you know what? Listening to Rise to Power, the sound enthusiastic enough. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's yeah. there. We've still got a fire. It's just whether the body is willing moving forward, so we'll get on a bit. So we've got to get, get our things out and get it done before we, or we, before we still can. And that's another, <laughs> that's another reason why we do stuff at such a, a rapid race. It races. We do uh, understand the march of time is upon us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we are trying to achieve as much as we can, what we can, and we can, <laughs> we're still enjoying it. <laughs> that's another thing that makes it more exciting for me as, as a fan of your music, is just how fucking vibrant and how much that groove is intact. I mean, I know that Mamori might bolt through, but that that fucking yeah. throughput of groove and um, I, I yeah. need groove in my yeah. heavy music, you know. Yeah, it's, absolutely. Uh, I mean, with, and with, it's with exciting. Actually, it's yeah. fast. It's energetic. It's vicious. Yeah. It's got everything. And of course, with Rise to Power, I've got my Rise to Power comic book. There we go. As That's well. something different. Yes, there we are Man- maintaining that fancy kind of like uh, connection there. Yeah, Absolutely. Andrew Sawyer's a very good uh, friend of ours, good artist. He uh, helped us do that. You know, we play, we're really pleased. That's something a bit different. We've never done that before as well. So that's uh, really... Ah, I, I was actually going to ask that question. Did I miss any previous issues? No. And will there be more in the Memoriam Comics line? I would like to think so. Hmm. Watch this space, people. <laughs> Andrew, oh, well. get your pens out. We've got, another, we've got some orders. <laughs> <laughs> so just going back to that kind of you know the the heritage behind all this why is the subject matter things like mocock you know the, the warhammer forty thousand stuff the warhammer stuff is heavily indebted to mocock the fantasy genre why is this stuff such a fucking good match for this style of music yeah i think it's just it just frees your mind isn't it I think there's that, that kind of thing where it's it kind of like the fancy novels uh, kind of really did kind of help me kind of just escape into a different world from, you know, the realities of everyday life. And the same with the heavy music, you know, it, kind of, it is a form of escapism in, in many respects, you know. Obviously, it's grounded in reality, a lot of it, what we, we talk about, but there's a whole kind of like that sense of freedom, that, that sense of escape, you know, which is, which is you know, Inherent in both, you know, kind of subject matters, you know, in the books and the, and the music. So I think that's what links them together so strongly. You know, yeah. uh, it's kind of like that, that freedom and that kind of that kind of like mentality to kind of create this whole imagery and, and, and world inside your mind. You know, which which um, is a great way to escape from the drudgery of everyday life. Mm. So, what else are you reading and listening to that's inspiring you at the moment? Reading and listening, are you having a laugh? I have got two young children. <laughs> oh, well. oh, no. They're not that young anymore, but oh. they've got a little lad that's nine, a little girl that's 11. I do not have a single moment in time to read anything or listen to anything apart from memoriam when we are writing the albums or learning the sets to play live. <laughs> and that is the brutally honest answer. <laughs> I did have a prolific... Uh, stage of my life where I did read quite a lot, you know, so I was really into uh, Patrick O'Brien, the whole, the whole Master and Commander series, which is yep. incredible. Really enjoyed that. My favourite um, authors were, uh, uh, trying to think what the names were, um, Stephen Pressfield, and he's, you know, at the gates and, and mm-hmm. the whole, you know, Sparta, Spartan, you know, Alexander Gray, all those kind of like historical um, novels. Um, Stephen Preston, I've said him, yes. Um, what's his name? Christopher Brookmere. Really like being mm. a big fan of Christopher Brookmere, who like, writes in the style of Tartan Noir. So it's very Scottish, because it's got a lot of Scottish dialect in it, and it's all, yeah, kind of like murder mystery, and it's based in mm. Scotland, and that's really, really good, well written. And uh, Neil Stevenson, I think he's probably my favourite author. You know, he's done, he did the Baroque, the Baroque Cycle. I don't know if you've ever come across that. It's like a historical kind of like... Um, 
it follows a character. It's a bit like this, actually. It kind of, it's a trilogy of books, and it follows a character across a period of time. So, uh, they're, that, you know, maybe I've maybe subconsciously drawn, I don't just realise that, drawn from, from these references already. But, yeah, so the past five or six years, my reading attention span has dramatically decreased. I spend my my relaxing hours drinking beer and watching television, watching documentaries, watching football, and just generally relaxing. So that's that's how I spend my leisure time these days. You know, we haven't talked about beer, have we? Given, yeah. given that you're you're such a beer fan and you regularly post your outrageous IPAs on Twitter. Beer yeah, is you know what? outrageous beer of the night. What have so, you got? Ghost in the Machine by Parish Brewing Company, who are based in Louisiana. So it's an American import. It's quite expensive, but it's got a nice mm. can. Can you see the can? So it's nice. I, can't, I could just see it. But part of the colour of it is exactly the same purple as your background. It is. So it's, it is. So, I did, but I can't yeah, see I the green skull. I did yeah. on purpose. Uh, a bit too close there. There we go. There's a green skull. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Yeah, eight cents. Very nice. Hazy. IPA, as I always like. So that, this is my tipple of, as a double Indian IPA. I do like my doubles, 8%. I've got three rules, three main, three main rules of beer consumption. My three main rules are, one, mm-hmm. it has to be more than 5%, otherwise it's not worth it. Yep. You get it? Two, it's got to have that kind of like hazy, copy. It's got to be cloudy, like a cloudy. Hoppy. Yep. Nice I, 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 I am it. a fan of a, of a hazy pale myself. And three, it's got to have a fucking stupid name. Stupid name with a ridiculous can. It's all about marketing. Uh, those are my three rules of beer consumption. And if you follow those, you can't go wrong. Hmm. It works. It's worked for me for the past three. And what, what I like about this whole craft beer explosion, which has taken off, Across the world over the past five, ten years, as much as I, I, I find the enthusiasm towards it was very kind of aligns very much like test, tape trading. Yeah. It reminds me of that it kind of you find a beer that you really really like, and then you share it, and you kind of like you know you post it, or whatever, you know, and you share that kind of experience of, of having it with other people that are of a like mind as well. So yeah, yeah. there's a very very kind of simple, cause like always full circle from tape trading to to beer. Mm. tasting so uh, yeah it's, it's, it's a strange it's a strange one uh, but yeah I, I love it you know it's kind of like the thing that's one of the things that I do in my downtime is, uh, is drink beer uh, not too much though not in excess I, mm. I only do you see when I do my posts there's two cans and that is all I will drink all right is those two cans maybe a few whiskies afterwards but um, but generally speaking two cans a night is sufficient for my intake and consumption otherwise Pissing yeah well we do live not only do we live now in a, a modern all new golden age of vinyl but we do live in a golden age of beer as well don't we we are now, we are it's, I, it's, I, it's I, a, renaissance, a renaissance yeah i made some selections earlier on i am actually full of fucking laggy at the moment though so i actually kicked off with a lem sip with a little bit of um north point spice rum in it just to uh oh, that's just a nice idea just to, just to just to give it a little bit of a kick good idea yeah uh so this is a uh, handcrafted on the north coast of scotland small batch sustainable spirits pots distilled spice rum mm. uh, it's do like, do nice. like my, rum. my favorite my, my favorite rum my room of choice is i like ray and nephews ray and nephews of proof rum Oh, my God. oh, good God. Yeah. I, I have horrific, horrific <laughs> memories of, <laughs> of a night on Ray and Nephew of Proof Room in Manchester around about 20, 25 years ago, and I've not touched it since. <laughs> yeah, you do scare that. But, yeah, one of my mates, Jamaican mates, introduced me to it, and I haven't looked back on it, so I did. That and my, 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 you know, my favourite um, spirit is, is single malt. I really embraced the whole single malt whiskey kind of thing mm. to a ridic- to a ridiculous level. Um, my, 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 I like them really smoky, really, uh, uh, you know, eyes of high lay. I, I don't like them very sweet. I like them not – like space side's okay, but it's the Isles, Western Isles, that I really, really like. The Freud is my go- go-to weapon of choice. Uh, some people some people just don't like it because it's too smoky. I, I am in that camp. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I love whiskey. Yeah, 
but yeah. I don't like 70% of whiskey. I always think whiskey is like heavy metal. I love heavy metal, but I don't like 70% of heavy metal. <laughs> so I'm a metal head and I'm a whiskey head, but I can't drink 70%. Well, well, and this I is can't it. Think that's the of it. There's so much of it around, so much, so, yeah. so much different different genres within and subgenres within the, the beer, within whiskey, yeah. with, with the music, that you kind of you find your own path through it, don't you? You know, we're all on this, we're all kind of like on this little journey. And we all find our own little separate paths across it. And sometimes right. they cross. Sometimes yeah. those little paths cross. And that's what makes it such an exciting um, time to be alive. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, my favourite whiskey is uh, actually from a, a little distillery near Pit Lockery called Edradour. It's um, the claim to be the smallest family-owned independent distillery in Scotland. But we we almost tripped over it about right. 15 years okay. ago when right. we were in that neck of the woods and I bought bought some from their um from their visitors shop and uh oh yeah I'd never go back it's terrific but Absolutely. on the beer front I I've, I've selected a uh, gravity well super critical fluid new england ipa 6% i'm being That's quite sensible That's yeah, I'm being quite sensible one. Yeah, because well, it is, a th- it is a Thursday. That's a, is, is that by again? Who's made Gravity? This is by uh, Gravity Well Brewing Company. Mm. Where are they based? Let's have a look. Uh, London. Oh, okay. Uh, Gravity well, well Brewing Company. I shall have to try them out. Yes. Compass West Estate, London. North 17. So, yeah, nice label. Now, I did bring up, but because you've just mentioned that it's a Thursday night, this is exactly the reason why I'm not going to bother with it. I'm going to save it for when Loz is off her. I'm going to punish him with it. Um, Ash, one of the friends of the show, recommended this. So thanks, Ash, for this recommendation, but I'm going to sit on this one until Loz comes over in a couple of weeks and punish him with this. This is <laughs> em- em- Emperor's Brewery, Kessel Run, Peanut Butter Jelly Imperial Porter at 13.1%. Yeah. Um, now, no, no. Love no, and see, I see, did see, swear. I, I, I've right. Okay, on to beers now. Porters, stouts. Yeah. Really, really, have tried my hardest to embrace them, and I do like the odd one. Maybe at the end of the night, it's got to be the end of the night though, because it is generally the end of the night when you go one yeah. round. Because they're hey, they're so, so fucking strong. Uh, I've had, I've, I've, you know, on my beer tasting thing, I used to do it have them quite regularly, but I could only probably ever get through one can in, in a session because they're all, you know, ridiculous 13, 15%. They all taste like engine oil. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're this mad. Is, they're mad. This is why I get them. Caramel, this is why I get them. Butter. Yeah. What's all this? Oh, that, that's, that's one thing. The one thing I cannot get my head around, I have tried quite regularly, I still can't get my head around. Is sours? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't can't do it. I don't get now, it. Yeah, I, I actually quite like a proper Belgian lambic, but but I think a lot of the sours that are being made just these days, they're too acidic. Yeah, they're just, absolutely. They're just too acidic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I do love my Belgians. I mean, triple caramelized is my favourite uh, Belgian. Hmm. So this is, nice. this is nice, nice and hazy. Nice, uh, got a nice cloud to it. Um, yeah. Now, there's there's a little bit of background to this whole Kessel Run Imperial Porter thing. Back when we started doing the podcast, Loz and I would would have a couple of beers, and we just got to the point where we would really just challenge each other and and It'd punish each other. Outrageous to, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this 330 mil can, I think, was was it nine pounds? For this three hundred and thirty mil can, but I've I've spent more, and I'm <laughs> sad to say that we've actually poured ten pound cans of beer down the sink because they're just That's been fucking, rich. fucking hideous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I know, I, know, I know that feeling completely. Yeah, I mean, I, I usually just pass on to somebody else. I know that might appreciate them, but but uh, it's a good, it's a good. Yeah, this is this is a glorious. This is a very very. Highly recommended. Parish Brewing Co. Ghost in the Machine. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it. I mean, horses, horses are different. Different people have different tastes. I know people mm. that love sours and live, live, live on them and, and, you know, and go out actively trying to search and find sours. But me, I, I just can't do it. It's just, it's just too fucking sour. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I'll stick to me, me New England. I uh, hazy. 
Well, I've got to say, this uh, this Gravity Well Supercritical Fluid at 6%, this hazy New England IPA, is pretty good. So on it's that ticks all the boxes note, that would pass my test. Yeah, absolutely. So on that positive note, um, I will say cheers, Carl, and thanks for dropping by Derry and Tom's to talk to us about Memoriam and beer and Warhammer. And we did mention Mocock a couple of times. So yeah, that's all, a couple of times. Yeah. There's a reference there. That, 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 is that, that's enough, really. Yeah, uh, I've read it. <laughs> <laughs> Better than say no. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, this has been a pleasure to talk to you. We could probably do this all night, but, you know, I've got uh, a hot date with, uh, with Married at First Sight. <laughs> All right, yeah. nice one, Carl. And yeah. uh, really, really good to see you and talk to you as well. Thanks Absolutely. very much. Absolutely, mate. Hopefully, our paths will cross physically on the road at some point in the future, mate. Absolutely. I'll keep my eyes peeled for Memorium gigs. Good, man. Pleasure to meet you. All the best. You know, I just said Memorium. That's, that, that's the rum I put in my lens. Memorium. Cheers. Massive thanks to Carl for braving the perils of the warp, resisting the depredations of Slanesh, and joining me for a chinwag. Memoriam's latest release, Rise to Power, is out now on the Reaper Music label, and you can find it, and therefore prior releases, at all good stockists, although I have my eye on the box set available via Nuclear Blast Records. The band website is memoriamuk.com, and you can also pick up the first three albums digitally via willitsio.bandcamp.com. Stay tuned after the transition for the title track from Rise to Power. And finally, thanks as always to our patrons for keeping the show on the road. First, those without tear, Anthony Piconti, Tim Cardos, Dave Dempster and Sebastian Weetabix. And to our chaos engineers, Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Van Ness, Anthony Porter, Benjamin Fletcher, Bill O'Cat. Brandon Mays, Craig Ledley, Dave Griffiths, Dave Voxman, Gabriel Laycock, Harvey Faulkner Aston, Jim Kirkland, Jim Knight, John W. Lays, Jules Lawrence, Mal Pertwee, Mary Catherine, Matt Saltz, Nelbert, Ofer Ziv, Paul McRandall, PJ Cooper, Scott Butler, and Simon Perrins. And of course, thanks to our crafty jugaderos Alexander Harris, Eliel Westenra, Loz, Taylor, Matthew Broom, Graham Holden, and Toby White. And finally, of course, eternal thanks to our patron demons. First up, and new to the marble plinths on the Tannel on Courtyard, Glenn Sawyer. Now, Glenn left us a YouTube comment on our Halloween special, and it went thus. Domain as a book is one I remember being introduced to by an older cousin, and, in particular, the other James Herbert books, Rats, Lair, The Spear, and The Fog, are books I associate with being a teenager in the 80s. They remind me of a time when my parents, my mum in particular, encouraged me to read anything that I got the chance to, and even though I was given a copy of The Rats when I was about 12, my mum and dad were okay with it. Like yourself, I'm a bloke of a certain age, 55 at the moment of writing this increasingly long and rambling comment. I grew up in the 80s listening to metal, playing D&D &D and every other RPG I could get my mitts on, and being exposed to mass-produced fantasy, war and horror paperbacks galore, especially Moorcock, Lovecraft, Sven Hassel, Leo Kessler, and James Herbert. Not so much as a gift from a family member, but more from trolling the second-hand bookstores that seem to be in every indoor market, at every church jumble sale, and in every seaside town we visited on family holidays. Your podcast is one I stumbled on about a year ago, and it's become my go-to for listening to on long drives through linking my phone to my car, and I first listened to the first book of Coram and have been hooked since. The combo of irreverence, humour, nostalgia... Geeky and jokes, talking about world views of writers then and how they sit now in terms of how we see things, and the sheer range of tangents you all go on are a joy. I laugh and learn with every new listen. Whilst I can't indulge in the beers side of the podcast as I'm usually driving when I listen, I have found myself more and more looking for odder beers when shopping and thinking about what beer might go best with what book read. I'm still working through the collection of podcasts and there's loads I've yet to have a chance to listen to, so there's loads still to be uncovered, I'm sure. I'd love to hear something about the Von Beck books at some point, particularly The Warhound and the World's Pain, and at the moment I'm trying to write a little RPG campaign drop-in for one of my groups based on that setup. Sorry, really did ramble on there. Thank you for the stuff you've done, and the stuff you'll no doubt add. 
Love the whole range of voices and contributors, and there's nostalgia which finds me thinking back to rooting through piles of paperbacks in a little bookstore in Ormskirk Market or in a Southport back alley to flick it through Kerrang, White Dwarf, and Imagine, 2000 AD, and to begging, buying, and borrowing copies of Chaosium's Elric themed games as a teen and beyond. I once sat on a table for a meal at a posh wedding reception with James Herbert and got a terrible case of fanboy angst, couldn't speak, and kept grinning like an idiot at him. I'm looking forward to enjoying the rest of this podcast later today whilst on the road. Cheers. Thanks, Glenn, for that brilliant comment. And it sounds like we're very much of a kind and would definitely have moved in the same circles at school. I read this to Phil too, and she said that was basically my mini-biography. With the locations changed, of course and the dinner with James Herbert sadly missing from my life. The best I can do is having a chip butty and a pint with Ramsay Campbell. But that's another story. On Von Beck and Warhound, that's on the must-get-to list, along with Warlord of the Air. I just need the bloody time. So stay tuned, Glenn, and thanks for your support. And thanks, of course, to Tone Milazzo, Alistair Davison, Andy Clark, Andy Darby, David Lee, Fred Keish, Gareth Wilson, Greg Faulkner, Gwen Barlow, Ian Stead, Imria, Jenny Stim, Jason Vogel, Jay Reza, Joe Monty, Lee Gary, Mark Hebden, Marius Latowskis, Miles Reed Lobato, Neil Burton, Paul Hillary, Randall Gatlin, Steve Round, Tom Murphy, the OG patron Norman Beresford, and last, but never least, Robert McMillan. Okay, enough from me. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruins@outlook.com. The web page is breakfastintheruins.com. We have our Patreon page too, and there are a few extra odds and sods on there. But for now, take care, stay safe, and we will meet again soon on the Moonbeam Roads. Yeah.